Hello. Now it works. Yeah, yeah. great, great. I have to leave a Safari and do it through Firefox. Yeah, yeah, the Safari is usually related with some problems. Yeah. Often with, I have a different problems with Safari. Okay, great to see you. Yeah. Uh, where, are you where are you now? I'm in Montpellier, in the south of France. Uh, so in France. Yeah. Um, okay, great to, to see you here and thank you so much that you agree to join and contribute to our um, public program of Keyword Week, um, which is dedicated this year to the task of self-reflection, as I wrote to you. Uh, and being uh, an art fair, we decided to um, talk, uh, to discuss this year the relationships between art and money, art and market, art and economy. and um, uh, as I understood from your description of your lecture that you sent, uh, you're going to talk more about anthropology or ecology and art. But um, as I can imagine, it still implies considering uh, an economic system we operate within. So I you suppose know, you will touch. Economy comes from the Greek uh, words uh, oikos and nomos. You no, know, it's the rules, nomos, mm. of the house, oikos. And that's where ecology comes from too. So, exactly. you know, it's very much uh, related. You know, it's the, how do you rule the house? In yeah. ecology, how do you rule the planet? But it's exactly the, the same uh, thing. You know. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So, um, uh, I'm giving the words to you and I will mute not, not to distract and uh, I'll be a listener <laughs> and then ask some questions in the end. Uh, so, you're welcome. I just, uh, yeah, to come back actually to the, the, your uh, theme, um, there's something which is very important. You know, when we talk about contemporary art, you know, the only question that's really relevant is uh, what, it, what is it contemporaneous with? As an artist, what are you contemporaneous of? Which is the, the main question, why? Uh, because every important artwork, you know, in history has always pinpointed artists, um, but to, the, f to the, the fore, something which was happening and was not seen by the others, in a way. And today, obviously, uh, the main uh, issue of uh, today <coughs> is uh, ecology and the climate change and uh, the way we're going to deal with the planet which is more and more loaded with inhabitants and the diffi diffi very difficult cohabitation between you know uh, spaces and uh, the difficult you know uh, way to deal with the atmosphere you know, how is it how are we going to survive within a totally polluted atmosphere uh, with resources that are actually falling, etc., etc. This is both economy and ecology. And if you look at the most important artists in, in history, you know, they always, and after centuries, you know, it's pretty clear that they saw something that the, the others didn't see um, from, uh, you know, uh, the prehistoric times to, to Andy Warhol or Joseph Beuys or, you know, contemporary artists. <clears throat> so, for me, what's really important to understand is that economy and ecology are not dissociated at all. You know. Money is almost nothing, it's just a symbol, actually. It's the symbol of class superiority, it's a symbol of uh, power, it's uh, only an equivalent, the abstract general equivalent. That's the definition that uh, Karl Marx gave of uh, currency. So what are we contemporary of uh, today, both beholders like me or artists? Um, in the 90s, it was pretty obvious that the, the artists were the contemporaries of the fall of the Berlin Wall, for a contemporary of globalization. And actually that's the way uh, the art world developed from the 90s to the 2000s, you know, uh, pretty clearly. It was a kind of time of conquest and from the beginning of the 2000s, we saw the walls coming back. And that's what we're cut away off today. Walls, more and more. Walls, you know, in the Mexican border, walls, you know, in, uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine. Everywhere we have walls. 
uh, both in Hungary, etc., etc. So, it's, in terms of uh, our imaginary, it's a very important um, event. We cannot see the world the same way than 20 years ago. And there is another huge event that actually affects um, the way artists see the world, which is what has been called the Anthropocene. This term was actually invented by the, the scientist Paul Kutzen in, um, in 2001 to qualify <clears throat> our arrival into um, an era where the human activities are impacting the, the, the shape and the functioning of the planet. So this is what is called Anthropocene, from Anthropos, of course, you know, um, human being. So we cannot um, <clears throat> think an artist cannot work without analogizing such an event in one way or another. It can be very indirect, it can be very direct also. But the Anthropocene and the climate changes that the Anthropocene symbolizes are obviously uh, in artists' heads all over the world uh, at the moment. I uh, curated uh, three exhibitions about this. You know, the first one was um, in 2014 in Taipei. It was the, the Taipei Biennial. Um, so it was really at the very beginning of um, when the word Anthropocene was not well known so much at the time. <clears throat> And the, the Great Acceleration was the title of this book, of this uh, exhibition. And it really was about, in a way, uh, relationships between the humans, the animals, the minerals, and every component of the universe. So it was really based on the possibility of, uh, you know, acknowledging, including into our uh, universe, uh, elements coming from other spheres, other rings, uh, in a way. And uh, I went on uh, two years late after with an exhibition called Crash Test, which was uh, where, for which, which was actually um, in Montpellier at La Panacée, the, the place I'm running uh, since then, which was about um, a young generation of artists uh, worldwide also, who were uh, actually not describing the world in terms of products, or objects, or any actually of those very material, massive elements, but trying to describe the world in its molecular aspect, working with the components of the objects we know, trying to understand the way society is structured out of um, molecules, very small things, actually. If it is absolutely important today, you know, because it's about those fossil energies that we're actually, you know, um, struggling uh, all over the world. Uh, the new um, uh, artificial, you know, materials, the, the, the cell phones we use actually, which need the extraction of very specific minerals in Africa or, or in Asia, etc., etc. So, trying to describe the world, to represent the world, from the molecular level. And I think it's very much related to the, 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 this new consciousness which is provided by the, the, the Anthropocene. And then I created a third exhibition called uh, The Seventh Continent, which, uh, um, which takes as a departure um, an image that we all know actually, which is this image of the, this huge continent, floating continent of plastic, you know, uh, in several spots, actually, in, in, uh, on, on Earth. The big, biggest one being called the, the Great Pacific Patch, uh, and it's as big as Turkey or Ukraine, actually. Uh, it's a huge, uh, huge uh, continent. But nobody wants to inhabit this, uh, this continent, because they're just made of garbage. And it's like the... The idea of the exhibition was that you know this new newly formed continent was the the um, anti image of colonization. We called uh, America the New World, 
actually in the, the 15th century, you know. And it was not new at all. It was inhabited by people who actually were here for, for centuries and millennia. And this new continent, we don't never call it the new world, but actually it is really the new world. It's a world that we actually created by ourselves. It's the, the, what's behind our attitudes towards life, what was created by our buying habits, by our way of dealing with matter. And uh, this uh, continent was the perfect image for a show that was exploring a bit more the idea of the Anthropocene by uh, coming back also to uh, um, ancient knowledges. Uh, what was, what is art actually today? Uh, reconnecting also with very ancient knowledges. There's a lot of interest by a contemporary artist for prehistoric art, for example, at the moment. The, the, the theme of the grotto is very important, or the cave is very, is very important. Uh, Ecofeminism is, uh, is really important. The, the, the feminist you know, um, point of view about ecology and the way uh, this um, male-oriented society creates also a very specific you know, a relationship towards the, the planet, towards Earth. And so, well, uh, I'm gonna get into the, just an introduction to what I'm gonna try to, to say today. Um, and uh, actually it's part of my new uh, book called Inclusions. Uh, and I'm, well, I'm talking about uh, what is an inclusive way of thinking the world, what is an inclusive aesthetics, uh, and for me, it's related to, even more precisely, not to Anthropocene, but to Capitalocene. You know, the, because the, the main transformer of society today is the production system. It's not the human beings uh, as such. It's certain human beings you know, um, obeying to a very specific type of economy. Uh, capitalism is much more, actually, an agent of this transformation than, than the, human, the human species uh, as such. It's the, the economic, economical choices we make and the sole exploitation of natural resources due to this system, which are the main cause of global warming. So uh, this new continent, the seventh continent, which is uh, three, more than three million square meters uh, of floating plastic, uh, was the metaphor you know, to describe to this, uh, this uh, situation. And this continent is actually very human. Um, it was constituted by our activities, um, but it also concerns all the other spheres, the, the animals, the vegetables, the, all the living elements that are actually coexisting uh, on the planet, and even technology, uh, obviously. All the elements that actually are Component, composing the world are actually impacted by this uh, new continent. And that's the first um, element I want to, to introduce in this, uh, in this uh, discussion. Uh, our relationship to space has changed. The, um, obviously then, the way artists are seeing the world is even more accurate and it was deeply transformed by those uh, elements. So I'm going to try to um, describe uh, in which way, according to me, uh, art was impacted by, uh, by this uh, crisis. The first thing is what I call the crisis of the human scale. Uh, we are used to representations uh, in classical paintings of human beings in, in a kind of decor, which is made by nature in general, this is gone. This has exploded completely. You know, it's not possible anymore to represent a human being, you know, as a kind of, a, you know, a, a dominating a figure uh, surrounded by kind of green space all around. You know, it's totally uh, anachronic, anachronistic. And uh, it's really important to understand that. This crisis of the human scale comes also from the fact that the more real the 
collective impact of our species is on the planet, the less uh, individuals feel capable of influencing their surrounding reality. We all collectively feel um, completely at a loss individually, as if we didn't have any uh, significant impact by ourselves as individuals on our, the life around us. There's a kind of sense of importance that is going on. Um, and the paradox is it goes with the demonstrable massive impact of us as species on the planet. So you have a paradox here. You, know, you have two, two lines which are actually going in different directions. Also, the techno structure we actually installed is becoming completely unco uncontrollable. We cannot control anymore uh, algorithms and the techno structure we actually installed. We have to uh, understand that, for example, the, the, this computerized economic system is imposed by, by algorithms which are actually performing operations at the speed of light. Uh, three quarters and even more today, I think, of uh, economic operations in the United States at the moment are, are coming from algorithms. So it's not even human beings you know, working together and the economy has become completely you know, taken off from uh, reality in a way. So human beings are the new victims of the infrastructure that they actually installed and created. And uh, this kind of huge discrepancy between humans as individuals and humans as species is creating what I call the crisis of the human scale, which leads artists today to represent the world in a totally different way. They cannot you know, take the human figure as something which is taken for granted. And that's the first uh, very important um, element I, want to, I wanted to introduce. Coming back to this uh, image of the, the seventh continent, the continent of garbage and uh, plastic waste. <clears throat> I think it's very important to make a, a, an anthropology of this uh, new world. And what, what, that was what the exhibition was about, uh, in a way. How is it possible to become the anthropologist of such a world where, with a population that's so uh, strange and uh, diverse also? And uh, I want to make a little detour by anthropology here, because it's, uh, I think, very important related to, to the, the stakes of uh, contemporary art uh, today. So, art has become a major uh, place of interaction between humans, uh, animals, objects, machines, vegetables, etc., etc. And secondly, we're living in a world which is off-centered. You know, there's no center anymore in this world. And if you look at uh, the, the evolution of, uh, of um, philosophy, thought in general since the, the 1960s, you will see that um, the main element, the main common point, is the critique of every possible center. You have the ethnocentrism, uh, phallocentrism, eurocentrism, now, anthropocentrism. There's a kind of proliferation of, of terms, you know, using centrism, uh, that show how it's important for us today, as human beings, to reject centrality. Because we understand there's something wrong with it, I think. The center, as a figure, represents the absolute foil of contemporary thought. Uh, and, of course, human, the human subject, is the supreme center. We held this notion in um, suspicion, actually, as we held in, sus in suspicion any pretension to hegemony um, as kind of injustice, in a way. Because we just feel um, that human beings are actually, um, maybe actually, the, are a colonial species. That's what we did from the prehistoric times, colonizing the real world. 
<clears throat> and this colonization uh, is a pattern which goes really uh, further than the 19th century uh, colonization. Art, of course, is a human tool. You know, it's, a, it's something which is fabricated by humans, uh, for humans. But it can include, as a kind of a translation device, the possibility of acknowledging the, the existence of other types of beings. You, know, you could see, and there would be a, a huge uh, lecture only about this to be made, um, how many artists are working today with animals, with vegetables, with trees, et cetera, et cetera. There, there is, a, and it's really important in, if you want to define today's aesthetics also, this will to, to engage in a kind of infinite conversation with other forms of life, which are actually existing uh, today. And that's really, that's really uh, important. In a way, I would say, that most of the artists that interest me today are, are those kind of anthropologists. Anthropology, uh, you will maybe answer me, you know, it does the word anthropos in it, you know, human being. And of course, we could say that, of course, it's not uh, relevant anymore because uh, we're not talking about human beings only. But anthropology has this particularity that it's a science, a way of thinking, a method, which has been evolving from the beginning, actually. At the very beginning, it was really used, uh, it was a colonial tool, in a way. It was a, a way to accompany, philosophically, the colonization of the whole world, and uh, through the, the, the notion of progress. So whenever the Europeans were discovering another type of civilization somewhere else, they were considering them as inferior and um, as their past, actually. And they had actually to progress between brackets to uh, access uh, to civilization between brackets too. And that was anthropology at the beginning was about, actually. But it's a method and an attitude, uh, not only a simple uh, field of knowledge. And the main uh, aspect of this attitude of the anthropologist is uh, dialogue. It's always based on a dialogue with the inhabitants. It's a kind of immersive way of thinking. Uh, there's a British uh, anthropologist, um, Tim Ingold, who was defining anthropology as a um, philosophy with the people in. And I think it's a beautiful definition of it, which is the one that interests me here, because it's very much related to art and the way the artists has, have also included, since the 90s at least, uh, the idea of dialogue and encounter within their work. Actually. It's built on feedback, um, and this is what's really uh, important. Um, this anthropological attitude has been shared by um, many artists, even since the, the, the 70s. You know, you can find people like Joseph Kossuth, for example, one of the main um, artists of uh, conceptual art uh, from the 60s. Uh, in the 70s, he went back to um, studies of anthropology. Um, and he wrote a very important uh, text, which is um, uh, Art as Anthropology. I think it was in 75, if I remember right. Um, in 1996, uh, um, the writer uh, Al Foster in, in uh, America wrote another important text called The Artist as Ethnographer. Uh, and um, I would just give another you know, uh, um, moment in 2000. 12, um, a very important curator, I think, uh, Okui and Vezor, uh, curated a very important show in Paris called Intense Proximity, um, addressing the, the, the diminution of distances between countries and culture as a kind of game changer in, in art. Proximity is a game changer, and that's where I want you to, to, to go to. 
the second <coughs> element that defines um, our times um, in relation to the previous ones, what is really new uh, today, is promiscuity. This new promiscuity that's existing between, for example, I can give you one example, a, a pangolin you know, in China and the world banking system. Um, Nutella and the forests in Indonesia, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that actually every um, element of the world is actually collapsing, you know, all the stratas that composed the world before are collapsing one to each other at the moment. We have new proximities born out of globalization, which were absolutely impossible uh, one century ago, and even 50 years ago. Actually. This promiscuity, this proximity, which is um, born out of communication, but also the production system, um, leads to totally, a totally new space that we never uh, had uh, acknowledged before. So this, obviously, this kind of collapsing you know, um, uh, elements propose for the artist a totally new set of, um, of subjects. Uh, and this is what really uh, interests me, even in painting today, for example, is to see how some artists like uh, Amber Wellman, for example, or Tala Madani, or many others, are actually in reinventing uh, a kind of new uh, promiscuous space within painting. Um, there is uh, another element uh, which is uh, crucial also to understand what's going on today in, uh, in, in art. It's the um, more and more common uh, denunciation of the very traditional um, division established by Western philosophy, fourth century before Christ, by Aristotle's first, uh, but by, then by many others, and by the Bible, between nature and culture. And that's really uh, fundamental, I think. Philippe Descola wrote a fantastic uh, book, the, the French anthropologist, uh, called Beyond Nature and Culture in 2005. And uh, he's explaining here, dialogue again, how uh, his work uh, in Amazonas has had actually led him to consider the, what we take for granted, what seems natural for us. There's nature on one side, culture on the other. This is completely artificial. And this artificial way of thinking, which was actually, I, I repeat, uh, coming from the Greek philosophy, coming from the Bible, coming from Descartes also in the 17th century, and all the, the, the Western science has led us to a completely awkward relationship to the world, um, saying that there is nature on one side and culture on the other, is, according to me, the matrix of all segregations, actually. Why did Europe conquer uh, other um, countries, um, enslaved, uh, so many people all over the world, because those people were supposed to be on the side of nature. Europeans were culture, and nature you know, were the people who were closer to nature. What about the segregation of women also? The fact that you know, at the birth of capitalism in Europe from the 14th, 15th century, uh, women's work was considered domestic and was, was actually expelled from the economic system to, be, to become free. Why that? Because the uh, same, um, same way of thinking. Women were actually pushed you know, towards the side of, of nature and men were supposed to be culture, etc., etc. This division between nature and culture is the matrix of all segregations. And we have to understand that, to understand the dead ends where we're actually, that we're actually confronted to today in our societies. That's pretty important. 
the, the French philosopher Michel Serre, who's a very important, you know, concerning this um, ecological uh, issues, uh, wrote, uh, I quote, our ancient cultures opposed culture, which had a written language, to nature, which didn't, while the new culture embraces cultures which don't have a written language and nature which does. Because actually, nature, big news, writes. We know today that um, trees are sending signs, actually they are communicating, that the, the roots network uh, beyond our feet is as um, complex and uh, interesting than the network of uh, the internet that we actually invented. Uh, this div dividing line um, is a really, uh, really crucial to understand. Uh, because some cultures which we considered as primitives uh, and that the first anthropologists uh, considered primitives uh, never accredited this ideological division between nature and culture. Uh, and now, today, we're actually um, witnessing the birth of the first global civilization for which the, the, the life has to be apprehended as a war, actually, and not as uh, divided into uh, nature and culture. It's really important to, to, to acknowledge this um, new uh, gaze. Um, humaniz humanism was the name also of this uh, exclusion system. Uh, this domination of the human species of the entirety of the non-human world, actually. Uh, and uh, it's important to, to to understand that those positions are not, um, we're not gonna hold them anymore, actually. We have to invent a new type of relationships with, with our whole uh, environment. And uh, contemporary art is actually helping us to understand it. And um, many artists are today in contributing to the invention of uh, First, a new kind of anthropology, what I call molecular anthropology, as I was saying at the very beginning, which I can define as the studies of um, human effects, human tracks, human prints in the universe, and the interaction between those um, effects and the non-humans. So it's an anthropology of the in-between. Uh, in, in one word. It's an anthropology of human beings uh, in resonance with their surroundings. And that's the word resonance, which is very important here. Eco, you know, what's our eco? What's the, the, the effect we do have? This anthropology is, is a totally new way of seeing anthropology. And uh, that's something which has been um, incorporated very strongly in uh, many uh, artworks uh, today, actually. This um, division between nature and culture has actually um, dominated our, our, um, the world, actually, um, for 2,000 um, years, more or less. And there is uh, a side effect of it. I was mentioning uh, Aristotle's at the a bit before. Um, the Bible was, was actually saying in the Genesis that uh, human beings had to control and uh, master the universe. It's very direct. You know, it's, in, in a few words, it's um, the idea of colonization. You know. Aristotle was saying something different. Uh, he was and it's much more related to, to art and makes, makes us understand what are the states in representation. Aristotle, you know, in his aesthetics, um, talked about ile and morphe, the matter and the form. And he actually described uh, art, any discipline in a way, you know, but uh, in a way that it was 
valid for 2,000 years and even more, 2,500 years. Which is the idea that, you know, we have to print a form upon matter. That's the classical uh, definition of art. A print upon an undifferentiated matter. The artists that interest me today are the ones who understood that this system was over. And you don't consider that there's kind of something inert that would be matter and their action that would be actually uh, uh, important and, uh, and defining. No, um, those times are over. Um, there's no matter and there's no form that there's only matter or only force. Uh, and artists are today working in a very different way um, than that. It's, uh, there's nothing neutral anymore, nothing inert. Everything is active. And art has to reveal the activity of matter and the activity of form together, actually. They are not opposed any, uh, anymore. They are not opposable, I would say. And if you look um, more carefully, we will see that this relationship between passive nature uh, informed by active culture repeats the same kind of segregations that we actually talked about. Male active, well, uh, female passive. You know, the, the, the civilizations which are <clears throat> don't have received progress yet while waiting for it by columns, etc., etc. Active, passive, il est morphe, exactly the, the Aristotelian the definition of aesthetics, is actually defining um, a whole system of segregation we have to get out of. And uh, we think our definitions of art, but also of what is activity, you know, what is passivity. This kind of huge uh, binomes, uh, this, this very um, uh, awkward divisions have come to an end. And you have to rethink the world you know, according to these new uh, visions. That's uh, very important. But let's, if we have to sum it up in a, uh, in a few words, I would say that the division between nature and culture uh, is the matrix of all existing political segregations. Sexism, racism, uh, colonization, social exploitation, sexual repression, uh, they all are coming from this Western invention of um, this kind of hierarchical table rising from nature to culture from the barbarians to civilization. Uh, and this uh, segregation is driven, of course, by the notions of progress. And today, um, in a more sneaky way, I would say, uh, it's uh, accompanied by the notion of growth, which is an economical notion. You have the societies who actually grow and the ones who don't. Growth, as an economical concept, has become this kind of uh, driving force that actually divide again uh, between uh, different uh, societies. What's interesting in uh, all the artists that are actually uh, working with this kind of molecular aspects of, um, of reality is that they are looking for, they, are, they have a quest, I would say. Uh, their quest is related to um, what is real. What is real today might be the biggest question uh, actually that anyone can, can, can ask. And art actually is actually posing this question as central. It's a, it's a very uh, huge problematic. What is real? Uh, it's not necessarily the, the um, you have different definitions of real. Uh, one is psychoanalytical in a way. Uh, I'm referring to Jacques Lacan's uh, uh, psychoanalytical writings. <clears throat> the real is what resists whatever, uh, whatever happens. The real has nothing to do with the imaginary or the symbolic. Uh, but it's not what is visible 
it's very important to understand that the real is not the visible. <clears throat> the real that the artists are looking for today, you know, what can be the, 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 the subject of their image production or the, the, the forms that they're actually producing, this real is what resists the huge um, de derealization uh, system which is organized by the dominant ideology, I would say. Um, and this ideology is founded on the notion of mass, mass production, uh, mass consumption. Um, this is the structural basis of globalized economy, the mass. Um, and the, the um, most pervert way of uh, using the, the, the notion of mass today is through algorithms and uh, which are collecting the, the what we call personal data of people. Uh, internet is an instrument of massification uh, in this way. It's the, the, the kind of um, the new dual power uh, in a way. And mass uh, is the opposite of the molecule. You know, you have the molar and the molecular. The molar is massive. The molecular is a septal, granulous, and comp composed by sometimes many different things, actually. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to, to, for me to, to think uh, contemporary art as a kind of a positional game between the molar and the molecular. And what's really interesting to see, uh, again, I take the, the example of contemporary painting because it's, some, because it's more, um, let's say, visible in, in this, uh, in this uh, medium. You see this kind of pulverization of the, of the shapes. Um, the difficulty to uh, represent uh, the world in a molar way, which is, for example, if you I don't know, uh, a mountain is not only a block. Uh, today, you can represent a mountain, uh, going even beyond Cézanne, uh, was actually, actually uh, addressing the, the theme of the mountain in a very complex way. But today, um, we have the mental tools um, and the artists have the mental tools to represent a mountain as a very complex set of uh, networks, even. It's not just a mass, it's not just one shape. It's a super complex reality. And this is what's the, the main subject of contemporary art for me, Exp the expression of this reality, the expression of this complexity of things, which goes by the, the, the understanding of its molecular structure. And uh, that's one of the most fascinating um, elements, <clears throat> the most fascinating theme that we actually see uh, today in, uh, in today's art. The opposition between mass and singularities, the opposition between the molar and the molecular. Um, in um, 1981, I'm just uh, quoting uh, uh, someone who I think is, import, is an important thinker, uh, Félix Guattari, that we, most people know for his um, work with uh, Gilles Deleuze in the 70s. Um, but Guattari in uh, 1981 discussed um, globalization, and its term at the time was uh, integrated world capitalism, um, from a chemical standpoint already. He was calling actually for what he called the molecular revolution. In other words, um, I quote, a molecular sabotage of the dominant social subjectivity in which the multiplication of interstitial struggles would replace traditional political parties. It was already, in a way, what uh, Michael Hart and Tony Negri wrote uh, 20 years later in, uh, in Empire when they talk about the multitude. Guattari, um, I quote him again, was um, talking about, I quote, a kind of bacteriological social war, something that no longer asserts itself according to clearly 
delimited fronts, like class fronts or protest movements, but rather in the form of a less apprehensible molecular revolution. So what, what I would say is, is that to struggle more efficiently, efficiently uh, we must um, adjust and leave the, the, the large molar masses uh, to what he calls the molecular level. Because as uh, Guattari demonstrates at the time, uh, capitalism had already begun to miniaturize its uh, apparatuses of repression, to quote him again. Uh, and the only possibility to, to fight against it is at the molecular level, uh, multiplying the horizontal initiatives. I quote Guattari again you know, about this molecular revolution because I think it's a very uh, interesting and a very interesting way to, to um, um, confront economy and ecology here. All sorts of viruses of this type, said uh, Guattari, are already attacking the relation of the social body to consumption, work, leisure, and culture, auto reduction, questioning work the political representation system, pirate radios, which was very existing at the time. Mutations with unforeseeable outcomes will constantly emerge within the conscious and unconscious subjectivity of individuals and social groups. I think those, those words are actually uh, very prophetic, uh, in a way. And um, it was in the text, actually, a uh, different text that made a kind of a patchwork. But there's one important book to, to, to read if it's translated in English, which I don't know, maybe not in, in, um, in Ukrainian and, and Russian, but it's The, the Three Ecologies by uh, Felix Guattari, where he actually <clears throat> makes a um, kind of constant comparison between the social, the political, the cultural, and the, and the environmental. It is always you know, uh, keeping all those things together, which is very uh, constitutes a kind of lesson for us, actually, you know, because we have this propension to yeah, divide again our uh, way of apprehending the world into categories which not necessarily correspond to um, what we actually are experiencing. Art is a very important tool of. Uh, this solution for all the binary uh, relationships and even the, this binary relationship subject object is for me something of the past in a way um, <clears throat> every uh, element existing on the planet have a common point they all receive emit stock or treat information. We all are from the tree to the human being. Trees communicate and we share most of our, our DNA with other species. We don't have the monopoly of expression and art has actually to include itself into a huge realm of emitted science by an hundreds and thousands of different emitters. That are the stakes, according to me, for today's art. <clears throat> and certainly, uh, uh, it's what really uh, passionates me at the moment. I just realized I've been talking for one hour, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really, really interesting lecture. and. Um, Actually, I have some uh, questions. I will try yeah. to, to formulate it at the moment. Uh, it, is, it is very interesting, this, um, your point about distinction between um, uh, culture and nature. Uh, and uh, while you were talking about it, I was thinking that actually this mm -hmm. distinction between culture and nature is uh, the same as the distinction between subject and object. But what I mean, um, uh, of course, everything and everyone is at the same time subject and object. But um, exactly. as I as I understand, this distinction is a subject is someone who is 
perceiving at the moment. L like, uh, let's say, like, when you are talking, you are an object for me. When I am listening to you, you I am a subject because I am comprehending you. And the same with culture and nature. So if you say that colonizers perceive uh, um, some uh, native uh, people as uh, nature, that's because these nat those native uh, people uh, is a mystery, you know, because colonizers uh, um, is someone who tries, who tries to understand something which is uh, difficult, which is, you know, mysterious. It's not completely understandable. Th that is the, the metaphor for nature. Nature is something that we don't understand uh, completely. Uh, that's the concept for things that we don't understand. Um, that's, that's the most difficult and the most beautiful thing with art, is that through art, we see the world with different eyes than ours. Because you actually, of course, the natives are mysterious, but you are mysterious to them. Yes, and exactly. As a human being, you see the world with, through your two points, mm -hmm. just this. But you are seen by how many gazes? How many people look at you at the same time? You don't know. Mm -hmm. So what is more important? Is it your two eyes? or the gaze, which is actually atmospheric, you know. It's over, everywhere, actually. People are looked at, you look at people, you know, and you cannot control it. But as we are, are limited, we tend to think that the most important thing in life is just our, our pair of eyes, which looks at uh, everything else. <laughs> and it's totally delusional. And the same way, you know, it's, um, Art um, helps us to make an effort to leave the categories we actually are imprisoned into. Us as a, me as a subject, me as a body, me as a male, me as French. No, all this can explode actually within the, the exhibition, within the, the, the act of uh, looking at art. And that's what is so important. Yes, and also I wanted to, to continue this thought that um, culture is something which is already understood somehow. So this is na na part of the nature, if you, if you take these um, binaries, which are already uh, explained and then we have an idea or, or a illusion that, that it can be managed. While nature is something which has some life of its own, its own rules that we cannot completely, you know, uh, influence. That's the binary. Like culture is something that we can manage, while nature, nature is something we, that we can. Are you sure? Manage. Are you sure that you can manage culture? I'm uh, not sure of that. Yes. So the next step of what I want. And are to you do sure is... that you're not part of nature? Yes. Because actually, where are you coming from? You are actually coming from a kind of. Uh, cell factory, which is the, the body of your own mother, right? Mm -hmm. And the mix you know, of the encounter of uh, you know, uh, spermatozoid you know, uh, and ovula, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all chemical reactions. So where is nature not in this, uh, in this process? Yes. Yes, what we come then, it just complexified organism but uh, the more we know about nature, the more we, we see that, you know, these complex operations at different degrees are everywhere. And that dolphins uh, have a way of uh, thinking there. Whales can actually communicate with each other, etc., cetera, et cetera. We saw ourselves as human beings as the masters of all this. Um, and we saw exactly like in classical paintings of the 17th century, you know, you are very well dressed people, you know, and all around, you know, kind of uh, theater stage, which was nature. Mm -hmm. This is not possible anymore. And this is what the artists don't do, actually, uh, at all, because they're not naive, you know, uh, because they understand the, the stakes of, uh, of today. And they cannot have this naiveness you know, of, uh, of being anachronic, anachronistic. Actually. Yeah, exactly. That what I was that I was going to to say because first, probably uh, like my first um, uh, 
thought when while you were talking was that you know when we're trying to overcome this nature culture binary uh, then we have to treat nature as culture like you know this constructivist point of view which was popular when i was a student but then uh, yes no. exactly it's really. probably exactly the, the opposite Just doing this you're perpetuating the division between nature and culture mm -hmm. let's stop thinking like that you know we there's no nature on one side and, and culture on the other side it's all intertwined you know what we call culture is part of actually our surroundings we are just emitting signs mm -hmm. what is an artwork it's it's a way to preserve energy actually the more energy an artist puts into his or her artwork and the more it will last actually we're still looking at um, artworks from the, the 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 15th century why because there was so much energy in it that it went very far and we still actually find an interest in looking at them why because they are they have invented a kind of a fuel actually a, a mix of complexity um, the capture of something which was crucial at the time where it was uh, painted or, or sculpted or, or whatever else. And that's why we're looking at it. It's interesting, why? No. That's what we call beauty, actually, is just that. This energy, beauty is energy, actually. So, in which way is it distinct from nature? Because that's exactly the same for species. That's exactly the same for butterflies who actually are wearing their artworks on their wings. We human beings project the artworks into different kind of uh, supports. That's the real difference. Yes, exactly. That's what I was uh, going to to say. And um, so I mean that instead of this uh, uh, instead of this division between, let's say, known and unknown, we have to uh, we have to understand that there is a Com complex network of known and unknown, controllable and uncontrollable, and we cannot divide it. Am I right in terms of what you were trying to? Well, knowable and not knowable yes. are, um, of course, you know, another way, more interesting way, I would say, to, to divide the world if you really need to divide it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, again, the, 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 even the original segregation, the original mistake for me is. Uh, ile morphe, uh, shape, form, against matter. It's this pattern of thinking that we have to you know evacuate, uh, and it's super difficult because it's encored in our brains actually um, since uh, for two thousand years. Yes, but then the question is how to uh, how to overcome this position of a subject, let's say, how to overcome this uh, position of, uh, as you as you say, that the, the most criticized thing is a centrism, like perceiving yourself as a center, how to, how not to be, how not to perceive the world as you are the center of it, because you are as a perceiving mind, anyway, you know, in the center, I mean, how many, you know, many very important artists, even, you know, back in time, were actually at a more choral, um, vision of themselves as subjects in, in, in painting. Um, there are many artists, many painters who actually are including other subjects within or having through having a dialogue with uh, previous painters, for example. Um, what I see today, for example, when I when I visit an exhibition by, for example, Pierre Huyghe, who did this important exhibition um, at the Serpentine last year. He actually uh, invites other types of organism to create. You know, it's a kind of collaboration. You know, with different types of uh, organisms. That's why the, the shape of the aquarium is very important in his work because the aquarium contains many different types of. It's like a sample of life mm -hmm. in a way. So it's not only it can. It's valuable and it's worth for painting as much as for installations or whatever else. Huh? You know, I'm talking about art in general. 
Um, there are many ways to uh, acknowledge and incorporate in your way of thinking uh, other types of uh, intelligences, other types of uh, you know, life than, than yours, other subjects than, than who you are. Actually. I don't think that the most interesting artists today are trying to express themselves. You know, mm. because who gives a shit about you know, uh, knowing what one thinks about the very specific subject? It's not the question. I think the most important artists are expressing uh, collectives, are expressing communities, are expressing subjects that are bigger than them, to be honest. Uh, uh, and the, the artist who just uh, expresses his or her little ego cannot be interesting for me today. Uh, uh, but artists who artists who who express in community, as you say, then uh, this artist speaks on behalf of this community. Uh, how? That's, you know, that's, that you, you're right to point out this danger because the, the idea is not to uh, express a kind of uh, cliche, you know, uh, image of uh, what you belong to. No, like uh, who is entitled to talk? Uh, to talk uh, the for community I'm talking about is not necessarily an existing constituted community. It can be an imaginary community. It can be, you know, many different things. You know, I was showing at the, the Istanbul Biennial, for example, um, the work of uh, many artists, Charles Avery, for example, um, who actually invented a kind of imaginary civilization mm -hmm. and um, is showing uh, different aspects of this civilization, which has actually not he's not expressing himself uh, of course there is something of himself within the work obviously but it's not the main stage you see what i mean yeah. so uh, and um uh it's also interesting that you started your lecture from the point that um we as a humans cannot influence uh, the situation like ecological situation but uh, what is influencing is kind of um, human, we as a species, right? Like, uh, or as a system. And um, that is, uh, uh, what is influencing is exactly the mass. Because in the end, you said that there is an opposition between mass as a core of ideology and the molecular level. But uh, as far as I understand, the uh, the agent, like uh, the real agent of what is going on here, is the mass, as you said at the beginning, like the mass, human species. Masses and systems, yeah, obviously, yeah, or um, technique in general. Think about you know uh, Pripyat. Mm -hmm. What's going on around Pripyat? No, what what happens to nature actually? all around Chernobyl. You know, those are things which are very concrete, actually, and which were caused by humans also. Mm -hmm. And it does create a game of echoes, you know, that's totally becomes a network. It's not just massive, it's not one thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's uh, the human as species. Uh, yeah, uh, obviously. You know. Yeah, and then the question is, uh, uh, the question of responsibility. So if there is no more a center, which, you know, a center might be something which is um, an agent, right? Like hum a human being as a center is an agent of some action and then he or she is responsible for that action. If there is no more center, but just a network, who is responsible? Like how to be, uh, how to take this responsibility as a human being? If you are no more, you know, the center of the action, then like you no more an agent anymore. What's the center in an um, ant farm? You know, you have all the, the ants, actually, well, so each of them are actually doing one very specific thing. It's like a collective brain, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, or bees, if you want. The center is just the place where they actually live. But there's no central power, actually, mm -hmm. governing the whole thing. You know, they're just doing what they think they have to do. And uh, interacting, you know, uh, interaction is the center. Interaction and, is the center. And the center, it, why internet was invented? To avoid the center. 
because the, the military in America thought that you know, if there was a bomb on a big headquarter of information, it would be a catastrophe. So they invented a network where you could destroy one point of it, but no problem, because the rest is still functioning. There's no center. Mm -hmm. So center is weak. Any center is weak because you can attack it very easily. You know, the strongest structures are the ones who have no center. So the, the most important things are going on in between, as I understood. Yeah. In between. And, and for human beings, between people, you know, the, the, the way they actually um, build uh, the proper uh, system of interactions that lead them to their goal. And uh, if you come back to, to, to art, actually, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's very interesting um, to see that also. That look at the, the um, well, actually, I should have uh, examples you know, behind me and trying to, but uh, I would love to, to show you how today the, the pictorial space, for example, or even the images, you know, are actually off-centered all the time, if avoiding as much as possible any center. That's why the, the pattern that you will see um, very frequently is the one of the constellation. Constellations mm -hmm. are uh, an obsession today, but for so many uh, artists, you can see that you know everywhere. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's precisely this, it's infinite. That's the sublime every day. That's the, the space with no center in a kind of complex interaction, which is that uh, this is wide, you know, wide interaction. And how does it, uh, how did this perspective um, influence the notion of authorship in art? Ah, that's a huge uh, question uh, with uh, social, uh, political, economical, uh, you know, uh, uh, sub-chapters, you know, so it's a bit <laughs> difficult for me to, to, to uh, to answer correctly to this question. But in what, what does directly concern me, um, the author is um, in a way kind of compromise for every artist. You know? I'm seeing in, interesting artists for me actually are always inventing a kind of uh, project, a kind of uh, authorship you know, um, ego Mm -hmm. which is distinct from them, strangely. Um, where is the authorship in Pierre Witt's uh, exhibitions, for example? It's always a collaboration, and you actually talk about the way the, the dog crosses the, 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 the space at uh, some time, you know, and you have the bees, and then you have the bacteria, you know, and then you have, mm -hmm. etc. Authorship is just like being a conductor in a, in a, for an orchestra, actually, uh, in a way. Yeah. Uh, in a way, that's the coordination of um, and the composition of a structure. Um, and composer would be maybe uh, the, the best way. Composer. You know, uh, maybe I should answer differently. Mm -hmm. The problem is not being an the author is the one who signs something, okay? Receive the honorarium. <laughs> just gets the, the yeah, the coins something. He, he just uh, puts it his or her nature on it. But what is production? Production, you know, is something which is questionable also. Producere in, in Latin means uh, having something, pushing something forward in front of you like this. Mm -hmm. uh, pro, advance, you know. I'm more interested in artists who are conducers, who are not into production but conduction. Mm -hmm. Con is with. So they're actually not producing, but conducing or conducting something besides them. No, they are at the same uh, level in a way. It's not the artist who says, this is my work. It's the artist who says, this is my work. It's not the same at all. Because the, you, you, you have the, the artist collaborating at, on the same line with other types of uh, subjects, other types of egos, other types of uh, strength, actually, who, which actually are accompanying him or her. Yes, but the art is also an economical system. And in this economical system, money goes 
to the person who is titled as author, not to this network, which is network of collaborators. And I think yeah, it is that's why I make a distinction between the two. It's really, uh, but it's, of course, the money doesn't go to the B in yeah. the Ritz exhibition. No. Yeah, exactly. So probably this new, uh, new perspective, new kind of thinking, and the new kind of artwork or new kind of um, uh, relationships require new new type of uh, art economy. I or know. Um, you know, till the seventeenth um, century, every artwork was actually in Europe. Every artwork was. Uh, aimed at a very specific uh, community or place. Mm -hmm. It's the, 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 the Deutsch, actually, in the 17th century, who really invented the art market mm -hmm. and uh, invented the, the smaller um, uh, painting. Um, so this is very relative, just a way to distribute you know, the same kind of forms or images. You know. But, you know, it's it's economy adapts itself all the time you know uh, it does it was a new economy also to to integrate uh, mp3 uh, there is a new economy to integrate you know uh, new new formats actually uh, all the time so there's no reason it does change you know. mm, i see the okay. same way you have many collectors today who actually buy works by Tino Segal, actually, they just buy uh, a protocol mm -hmm. and they have to, you know, um, to play this protocol, to re replay the, the protocol when they, when they want. But that's what they actually acquire when they acquire a piece by Tino Segal, for example. So, you know, art is not a specific type of object. It's an energy. And as we know, in economy, energy you know, can be conducted you know, in many ways and distributed in many ways and diffused in many ways. Exactly the same for us. So uh, the money in this system might be also distributed in different ways, you know? because still in most cases, the money dis is distributed the, the same way, like there is an author, there is a buyer or the gallery or an yeah. author. So, you know, these, the paths are the same. So probably we can think also of some different... This is what you know, many people are actually trying to think about around those ideas at the moment, especially in the, this period of, uh, you know, uh, pandemia. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many um, talks and discussions and texts, you know, uh, all, all over the world. Mm -hmm. about uh, new economical possibilities for, for art. What, what does it mean to be more local? Um, uh, how can we invent new ways of, uh, you know, producing uh, art, you know, with a lesser <laughs> impact, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. All those questions are the main questions of, uh, of today, and they are obviously linking economy, uh, art, and ecology. Sure. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. It was really thank interesting you. to talk uh, to you. Sure. And um, keep in Good touch. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah.